Say the reason I usually encourage people to look because uh, very few of us read the Bible regularly, and that's not a put down. I, sometimes I recommend it that you don't read it because it's it's such a difficult book to understand the way it has been manipulated and translated and changed and etc. 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 So uh, if it's not just a, something to read, it has to be something that you have to do a lot of study and research. To me it's like reading, um, I have several different uh, books on the physical anatomy, you know, books that are about how the body is constructed and all of the intricacies of the body and, and I don't know anybody that's ever just sat down and read a book like that. But that's what the Bible is. It's that intricate. It would be just like reading Gray's Anatomy. Any, have any of you ever read Gray's Anatomy? <laughs> Probably if you were studying to be a doctor, you would read Gray's Anatomy. And make, most likely if you weren't studying to be a doctor of some sort, medical doctor, eye doctor, tooth doctor, whatever kind of doctor you're trying to be, you probably wouldn't read Gray's Anatomy. The Bible is like that. It's a, it's a book that has been so misread and so misunderstood that people don't read it. And so I understand that, but when I share things, I want to share things from this marvelous book, but it's very different from what we've been taught, from the things we have been told. And so uh, that's the, one of the reasons I say seeing many times is believing because when I show you something from the Scripture and you can see it, then it kind of helps connect the dots, you know. It kind of helps to make one plus one equal two, et cetera. It kind of helps to fill in those blanks that we would have. So I, I say this, Genesis 1-1 probably has never been and maybe never will be totally extracted for all of the content that it is in it. I would say this, that it is probably the seed, like a semen that builds a physical body, or a seed that grows a phenomenal tree, etc. It is the seed of the Bible, and if it's misunderstood, obviously the rest of it will be totally misunderstood. And I find that to be the, the biggest case that we have, is it's mostly misunderstood. For me, I, I, you know, I, I keep uh, trying to get my head around the fact that I have been preaching or teaching, whatever we call this thing I do, for over 40 years, and that, that's for some reason had just <laughs> run out. I'm not even 40 year old. How could this possibly be that all of a sudden I've been doing this for 40 years, and here's where I'm at. I've found that right now what I see is more exciting and greater than anything I've ever seen. And I feel that the benefit of it is greater than anything I've ever seen or shared. And so I mean, that just kind of says, I haven't even gotten started yet. And here it's been a number of years in this journey, and that's exactly what it is. It's a journey, a phenomenal journey, one that, uh, that has been very exciting and very strengthening. And, you know, as Austin, my grandson, walks in, I, my heart goes more and more to the generation of my grandchildren and what I hope will one day be my great-grandchildren, if they ever catch on to how that works, and uh, that will be wonderful. <laughs> no, yeah, little hints on purpose, but nevertheless, you still understand what I'm saying? But my heart beats more and more for the generation that's alive right now. This, this generation that we have in the earth, many of them are calling the millennials or even the ex-children, my grandchildren, I guess, are the ex-generation, and then the millennials. My heart beats more and more for, these, for this beautiful group of people that are here that's going to be the rulers of the world soon. And that's going to be great and wonderful. So, saying all of that, if you would, I want you to go to Genesis 1, chapter 1, and I want you to look at several verses that I know you are familiar with. Genesis chapter 1, and you know, uh, probably you could quote these few verses. Good chance you could. Uh, but let's look at it. Verse 26. And I'm just going to change one word. All, uh, you know, usually I'll change a lot of the words back to the original Hebrew. But in this case, I want to just change one word and make an emphasis about that word because if this word is misunderstood, then 
what I'm about to say will be misunderstood. Okay? So Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, it says, And God saith, the word actually in the Hebrew for saith is not the English word for saith. Okay? Actually, the Hebrew word that's used here for saith is used ten times in the first chapter. And that's an important number, and that's important because it's describing what's called the Kabbalistic tree of life. Most everybody has heard of the tree of life. Very few people have any idea what the tree of life is, but most everybody have heard, they've heard of the tree of life. And so the number 10 is a symbol for the Kabbalistic tree of life. And in that tree, you take, you take the, uh, I'll go ahead and give you a picture of it so that you will understand it. This is how it's drawn in Kabbalah. Kabbalah just simply means the ancient Hebrew of receiving from the source. It's that simple. How many of you would like to be in that position? Everybody, right? If God is the source and God is all powerful and you're in a position to where like an antenna, you can pick up that energy or in other words, you can some way tweak yourself or awaken yourself to receive that energy of the source or power or we call it God, then that would put you in a greater place for yourself. Okay? Right? Amen. So this is called the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. And it's called this, uh, and these are called the Ten Sephirots. But it's the word that's used there for the word said. Now if you think about that, the English word said, now, if I said something, is that past tense or present tense? It's always past tense, right? So, if God said something, that put God in the past tense place, which is impossible. Because God could never be in the past tense. God always is. So, that means God is always present, just exactly like it tells us in Ecclesiastes. God is a very present help any time we have a need. He's not a past help. Many times people are trying to get a hold of this past source or energy we call God or trying to just reach out into the future to try to get a hold of this future source that we call God, but very few of us are in tune to the fact that God is present. God's always now. So actually that word should not have been translated said, but it should have been translated God is saying. That always puts God's presence. God is saved. God's presently saved. Now, what does that mean? Energy is constantly coming to me even though it may be repelling from me. How could it do that? It repels from me if I'm not in tune with it. I, 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 don't, I just didn't get it. Went past me, around me, or through me. And I didn't receive it. The key is to be a receiver. Understand that? The key is to be that magnetic receiver where that energy will build me, strengthen me, and empower me. So that was the whole purpose of this Kabbalistic tree. It's called the tree of life. Now, there are, here we count, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There are 10 of these sephirots, and that actually means points of energy or energy points where that we are receiving the power. In Hebrew, in the base language, there are two ways to look at Hebrew. You can see the base language. And then you can see the extended language, which has the extended language which deals with the five physical senses. So it adds five glyphs or characters to the alphabet. But the base alphabet has 22. So if you take the 10 and the 22, you come up with a number 32. And 32 is a very powerful mystical number. You see it in a lot of the secret societies like in Masonry, it's real popular in Masonry. 32nd degree Masonry is one that's become a shrine or whatever they reach the, the plateau. And that's how, this, that's how this tree is built. It's built mathematically and it's built alphabetically. And they have to be combined. Because in Hebrew, there is no figuring system. It doesn't, and the figuring system is the alphabet. So that every glyph has both a numeric value and it has a vocal value. It's the same thing. Like, for instance, the first glyph is called Alif. It's that like that. 
and it's called number one, and it's more or less, we call it the symbol of God. Like if we talk about this word God, right here in Genesis chapter one, <coughs> it's used 32 times. And it's always this word right here, E-L-O-H-Y-M. Elohim. And here's what it means. It always means, always means God's plural. And then that's contrary to everything you I have been taught. That's contrary to everything we've ever thought. But it is plural. It does mean God because it's referring to the multiplicity of the power of God. If I were to try to break it down into just a singularity and call it God, I would just use this word right here, El. And that's used a lot in, in Scripture. I mean, that's used like two or three hundred times compared to Elohim, which is used three or four thousand times. Okay? And so if you use it as El, it's referring to if this is the cardinal cross, the circle represents the universe, and if I broke this down into 12 segments and call it the astrological wheel or the Maseroth, or the zodiac, which are all the same things. If I broke it down into one section, that one section would be called God, L, or in other words, power. If I had all 12 of the sections in, it would be called Elohim, powers, the powers of God. Now, are those important? Yes, everything about this, this Kabbalistic tree of life is important. If you realize God is saying something to you right now, if I could convince my grandchildren, not about religion, but if I could convince my grandchildren that God is saying something to them, if they could position themselves to receive it here, then it would empower them. It would strengthen them. It would help them. Because there's not anybody that I know of that's in this life, that's on this earth at this time, that's not riding bumps, ups and downs, hills and valleys, that experiences good times, bad times. Hello? <laughs> Is any of you in the picture of the boat? We're all in that same boat, right? Yep. So, Genesis 1.26, it says, And God, that word God is Elohim, it means the gods are saying. Not said, not past tense, but the gods are saying. Now look what it says here. That's, the gods are saying, let us, 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 gods, us, you can see that the vernacular is clear, right? Let us, the 12 powers, the 12 astrological, universal, zodiac powers, let us make, look what it says, and I want you to see it, let us make man. And the next word is the one I really want to emphasize. It says in, that's, that's wrong. It should be the word as. Now, if I made man in my image and I made, or I made man as my image, there is a vast difference. If I made man as my image, then that image is me. Hello? Yeah. Because I haven't made it in me, that means to be a similitude or maybe in a likeness. But if I make it as me, the image is me. Hallelujah. It's one way that we have really gotten off track. It's hard for us to see or say as God is, I am. That's the whole purpose of the four Gospels in the story of Jesus. Jesus said, as I am, so are you. As I am in the Father and the Father is in me, Jesus could have said it this way, as I am as the Father and the Father is as me, so are you. But we haven't grasped that. Because the story of Jesus is exactly that. It's a story of humankind and how humankind has been empowered with this, this energy, this essence of all power. And it's never been anything wrong with it. It's never went awry. It's never not doing what it's been always designed to do. It's just that we use the power irres irresponsibly. And by using that power irresponsibly, do you know what we do? We create havoc and we create chaos and we create, we create things in our life that we don't like, that we don't want, that don't serve us. And then we become the servant of that that we have created. I'm speaking to me. I'm not talking to y'all. I'm talking to me. 
I had, oh, I spent these 49 plus years doing this and I'm realizing now what I did all these years. And I'm trying to awaken to that way. I can create this in a way that would serve me far more wonderful than I have in the past. I just have to wake up to it. And it's not a matter of coming and having a religious experience, but it is a matter of experiencing salvation. But it's not salvation like religion taught me. It's salvation that makes me whole. It's that salvation that makes me strong. Yes. And I don't want to be strong. I, that's what I need. I want to be strong so I can go and do and be what I'm built and designed to be. But if I am destroying myself at the very point of myself, it's nobody's fault. So you see, nothing that I will share with you this morning can you blame the Baptist church on. <laughs> or the Methodist church, or the church of God, or your mama, or your daddy, or your neighbor, or anybody. Because all of them, all of us have and do make mistakes. But it's no one's fault. It's generally, it's the lack of the, of the right information. It's not because you haven't given it your best. It's because you didn't have the information to do it right. Because most of you gave it your best. Most of you are giving it your best because that's all you can give it. But if your best is not, in, is not empowered with information, if your best is empowered by ignorance, think about what it's doing for you. And that's what's happened to us. It ha it's happening, and again, it's not anybody's fault. I don't blame anybody. I'm not mad at anybody. I'm not upset with anybody or anything. I'm excited with what I see. <laughs> I'm seeing the truth and the truth is doing exactly what it's designed to do and that is make me free. The, the truth will set you free. Now, if we can see this passage that I'm saying, let look at it real closely again. And God said, let us make man as our image after our likeness and let them say that would include me Say that will include me. And let them have what? Dominion. dominion. Let them have dominion. Well, you know, you probably have your own definition of the word dominion, but it means, actually, it means to rule over. Well, what are you to rule over? Well, I want to say this to you you're not to rule over your husband or your wife. You're not to rule over your children. You're not to rule over this and that. You're to rule over yourself. You see, we've lost some vast and vital information in the last 1,700 years. The church age has brought us into a devastating place. It has left us powerless, helpless, and ignorant. And it's told us most of the time that we don't have the power, but there's one outside us that is all-powerful, and whenever, if I can get in touch with him, he might help me. So we're constantly looking outside ourselves for the power that's already within ourselves. Right. And, we, and we don't recognize that. No one has really told me. No one has really instructed me. And so if I have dominion over, and he, you know, he lists a slew of things, actually, he's talking about the creation of the earth. But there's, a, there's an important point that's not made. For instance, if, if I am to understand this book that I call the Bible, it has several companion books. This being one of the companion books. It has several companion books that if I don't have the companion book, I'm not going to understand this book. And there are many companion books that help to give clarity to some of the illustrations that are in this book. And you know what we've been told? This is the only book you'll ever need. This is the only book you should ever read. And lo and behold, we've they twisted the thing and they've got it so contorted and so deleted and messed up that hardly anybody can read it and you can get anything out of it that it really does say. And we know that is true. So, I'm going to finish reading this. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. I heard one guy say, so that means you have power over creeps. So God created man in his own image as the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them, blessed them, and 
God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over. That's twice there within three verses he made an emphasis on dominion. Wants us to have dominion. And the thing about that is, if God said that, is that true? Yes, it is. You have dominion over your world, and if you're creating your world out of ignorance, you still have the dominion and the power to create it. And you do. And we do. Most of what we do create, we create it haphazardously. We don't recognize it. I remember, gosh, I go back 40 plus years now when I was studying and doing research and trying to wade my way through all this because it was totally new to me. I was ignorant to it. I didn't understand this stuff. In my middle 20s, I had my conversion experience and I was totally ignorant to the the things of the Bible. I had not read it, so I didn't know anything about it. Here I'm, I'm looking at all this and hearing all this other stuff, and at the same time, religious systems trying to brainwash me, and this group is trying to say, believe our way, Lynn. This other group said, no, come over here and believe our way, Lynn. And this other group, no, come over here and believe our way, Lynn. And so here I was, by God, y'all got so many different ways for this one thing, I, I'm confused. So I thought, well, is the Seventh-day Adventist right? They say they are. Is the Church of Christ right? They say they're the only ones that's right. Is the Church of God right? They say they're right and you've got to get the Holy Ghost. You ain't got nothing. Is the Baptist right? They say they're all right. <laughs> so here I was just grappling to find out what was right. I, could, I couldn't find it in all that. I just got more and more confused. So let me read you a couple of things, or quite a few things, as a matter of fact. I want to read you some notes that I wrote in, uh, in this book here. I write in these books just about as much as they write in these books because they spur, they spur thoughts in my, in, in my thinking and so as a result I just read a lot, I write a lot. Religion has taught us that Adam and Eve lost, every one of you been taught this, they taught us that Adam and Eve lost, parentheses, in other words they sinned and fell from their superhuman status. You, you thought they were superhuman. Didn't you? You were told they were. And then something happened, right? A snake, serpent, serpent, the devil, Lucifer, whoever, whatever. He tripped them up. That's true. That's not true. But we were taught that is, we were taught that is true. So you were taught that Adam and Eve lost their divineness. We're taught in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, these are the two most corrupted chapters in the entire Bible that, in other words, when I say they're corrupted, I mean they've been changed, they've been twisted, they've been tampered with by the priest craft on purpose. They have purposefully twisted and manipulated the Hebrew. But you can go back into the original Hebrew and still find the original meaning there. That's what's so amazing. They have taken words like... like uh, Nafesh Esh Shamayini, they have taken that word, which is still there in the original Hebrew, but what they have twisted it to say is so far off base. I'll show it to you in just a minute. They've taught us uh, that Eve ate the apple and disobeyed God by listening to the serpent, in other words, Lucifer the devil. And at that at that time put the whole human race on a downhill course to death and corruption. These complex ideas, and I just wrote a little note here, generally ideas rule mankind and man's mind. These complex ideas are the root that caused mankind to spiral downward. Mankind position, position on the earth is as he or she were God <coughs> as God, but they don't know it. Man just hasn't recon recognized it. They don't know it. Let, uh, let me read something else here. As poets say that God is in a whirlwind, in the thunder, and in the fire, and in the hail, in the sun, and in the rain, so philosophy can say that the infinite life is in the tension of opposites everywhere. If you have an ear that you can hear that, it's saying that in your tension, 
there is power in life. So if you are in any kind of attention right now, you can find there's something in that that will empower you and push you to a greater you. You see, something that was over the temples of all buildings, we call them sanctuaries or temples or tabernacles or churches, prior to 1725, 17, I mean 325, 1700 years ago, the Nicaea Council of Crete. Prior to that, above the doors were these words, man, know yourself and you will know God. We've lost that. We should have it over our door. Because if you don't know you, you really don't know anybody. Because it's only you that can know you. And you have to know you. But what we want to do, I'm trying, if I'm married, my, I, want to, I want my spouse to do a certain way to please me because I feel a certain way. Not realizing that it's not him or her, it's me that's either invalid, insufficient, or falsely empowering myself to create my havoc. That's just really good preaching, y'all. <laughs> okay, so... As the poets say that God is in the whirlwind, He's in the thunder, He's in the fire, He's in the hell, He's in the sun, He's in the rain. So philosophy can say that the infinite life is in the tension of opposites everywhere. Both ends, both pull and resistance are equally God or they are of God. Heraclitus says God, he says, is day and night. Winter and summer, war and peace, surfeit, surfeit and hunger. The opposites are identical, at least in their purpose. And that's sometimes that's kind of difficult for us to see and to understand. So I want to read you something else I wrote over here on another page in this book. Everyone who comes into the world comes here with a mission. I don't care who you are. And your mission is not, never was, and never ever will be to save the world. Even though many of us, like myself, when I first got this conversion, this experience that I had, that was what I thought. Finally, I thought, well, my mission is to save the world. I need to get everybody saved and get them lost or they're going to wind up in hell. Well, I didn't realize that hell was a concoction of the church. It did not exist in any other religious form other than Christianity. There was no such thing as hell and other concepts and ideas. Even though there was that, that uh, idea of torment or punishment. And the way that torment or punishment was that I would come back into this life and in my reappearing in this life, I would pay for the things in my past life. Or I would at least answer for those things. Or I would at least correct those things. That was, that was took out of the Christian scriptures. That was taken away from our, our Bible. It was in the Bible prior to 325. It was in the Bible prior to the creed. But you see, the, the Catholic Church has had so many creeds. I think they've had seven major creeds, and each creed changed something from the previous creed. You know why? Because they realized that if anybody really researched that creed, they would find all kinds of loopholes in that creed, so they kept changing it. And they changed it seven different times in the last 1,700 years, and we're too ignorant to go and read the creed to just see what they said to change the thing. They see it. If something is right, something is true, and something is uh, the truth, it doesn't need to be updated or changed. <laughs> Every one of us come into the world with a mission. And that mission is not to save the world and its hell-bound ways, but to save and restore and to redeem myself. That's the only mission you've got. Your work is you. Your work isn't me. Your work's not your neighbor. Your work's not your mom and your daddy, your brother, your sister, your husband, your wife. Your work is you. And I promise you, if every one of us get really busy about the work of me, if I really get busy about who I am and what I'm all about, I will find the things around me will begin to change, hallelujah. And that will begin to change for my greater good. So the work that is given to me in my commission was a work for me. 
And so now that I am beginning to see that for myself, I want to share with you what I see. And I pray that if you get in tune to it or turned on to it or excited about it, that it can it will empower you. And it will empower you to be, for you to be a greater Jew. <laughs> and that's the great thing about it. Now, I have the Yubaneshah. That is, uh, there's two volumes, volume one, volume two, the Yubaneshah. That is a, a Hindu holy book. There are quite a number of great, great books that should not be afraid to read. No one should ever be afraid to read the Tao, the Tao Te Ching. That's the most phenomenal book that's probably ever been written. Most likely it is the most phenomenal book ever been written. It's only, I think it's only 82 chapters or 82 paragraphs. The book can be, huh? 81. 81. 81 paragraphs. And some of those paragraphs are only like three or four words in a sentence. And, that, and, that, and they're profound. But anyway, the Upanishad, this is a, another Hindu holy book, several volumes. Uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous book. The Upanishad, uh, in there, there are few explicit references to the misery of life caught in the ceaseless cycles of birth and death. Now, in Hindu, the cycles of birth and death have to do with reincarnation. You come in, you live, you go out, you come back. How many of y'all have seen that movie about the dog? What was the name of it? A Dog's Journey. A Dog's Journey. If you haven't seen the movie, the A Dog's Journey, it is just a phenomenal, cute little movie. It's just, uh, it's about a dog's journey through through the cycles of reincarnation. And it's just, just really tremendous. But anyway, uh, there, uh, Upanishad, there are a few explicit references to the misery of life caught in the ceaseless cycles of birth and death. And that's, in Hindu, that's called samsara. Samsara just simply means to recycle to come back to, to be reborn. Everything in nature is doing that. Everything in nature does it, including you and me, because we're part of nature. Hallelujah. Its authors saved the system from pessimism by the joy that expressed the message of redemption proclaimed in the book. They point to the earth life as the pathway to self-perfection. I hope you can hear that. So you're not going to get perfection if you get to go to this place you've been told that is perfect. Now what place was that you were told that is perfect? Heaven. Heaven. And we don't even know what heaven is. And I hope in the next 15 minutes I can help us clearly see what heaven is. It's not a place to go to. It's actually who you really are. So you are heaven. And if you want to go to it, just go within yourself because that's where it's at. So... To this end, the discipline of samsara has to be undergone, but it brings great rewards. Strenuous as it may be, life furnishes the zest of a battle. You ain't been there? You there now? Yeah. Okay. It's, it furnishes the zest of a battle for the rewards of self-conquest. Samsara is only a succession of opportunities. That's, that's all your failures are. They are successions of opportunity. They aren't failures. I mean, you know, we talk about, well, I failed at this or I failed at that. You've never failed at anything in your whole life. You may have found ways that don't work. I forget, uh, I think it was President Lincoln run for the office of presidency 12 times. Would you say he wanted to get into that office? <laughs> How many people do you know would try 12 times? How many of us would try to do anything over once or twice? I failed. No, you never fail. You never fail. You find ways that don't work. And, I mean, how many, how many ways did the so-called Edison find that the light bulb didn't work or electricity didn't work? How many thousands? Thousands, thousands of ways that it didn't work. And Tesla, no telling how many ways Tesla found stuff that ways it didn't work. Uh, strange as it may be, life furnishes the zest of a battle for the rewards of self-conquest. 
Samsara is only a succession of opportunities. Life is a stage in spiritual growth to perfection. A step on the road to the infinite. Life is not an empty dream and the world is no delirium of the spirit. Hmm. I, I, that was Alan Boyton. I like the things that he said right there. Okay, so if you will go with me to Genesis chapter 3. And uh, I want to show you something here in this passage of Scripture. And, of course, there's been a lot of manipulation and changing in these, some of these phrases. But this is a phrase that, that again, you're familiar re with. And uh, I want you to just look at these with me. Genesis chapter 3, just this one verse. And God doth know. Now look at verse. this. Five, verse 5. Genesis 3, verse 5. And God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof. Now, what is he talking about? He's talking about eating from the tree of... Uh, talking about eating from the tree of... Uh, I'll do, I'll do it this way. Okay. Talking about eating from a tree. And what religion did to us, they said, well, the two trees there. There's nothing in here that says anything about two trees. Have you ever heard those two trees? Mm -hmm. There's nothing in here that says anything about two trees. They said in the middle of the garden there's a tree. And that tree is a tree of life, which you can't see. Why? It's under the surface. And then there's the tree of knowledge, which you can see. Why? Because knowledge always bears fruit. Do you understand what happens if you don't have knowledge? What happens to you if you don't have knowledge? As a matter of fact, it tells you in Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah chapter 5, if you don't have knowledge, you'll wind up in captivity. It tells you in the book of Hosea, it says, if you don't have knowledge, you can be destroyed. That's right. It'll tell you in the book of Proverbs dozens of times, that's, that's the, the book of, of understanding and wisdom, the only way you can get understanding and wisdom is through knowledge. Now, do you think God wants you and me to live on this earth in this dimension ignorantly? That God don't want you to have any knowledge? God wants you to be totally ignorant? If you need to know anything, you better go ask Him. How many of you would like your children to be that way? Every time they needed to do something, if they wanted to buy something, if they needed to do, go somewhere, they come to Mom and Daddy, can I go do this? Can I buy this? Da, da, da. They'd drive you up a wall, wouldn't they? You know what you tell them? What you tell them? Go do it yourself! <laughs> Quit bothering me with it. Why? Well, do you think that God is not saying that to you and me? Grow up. You know, put on your big girl panties or your big man panties or whatever it is. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? I'm not sure if I'm saying all that right. But this is the tree. There is the tree of the knowledge. And that, not, that knowledge in Hebrew is called Ra and Tov. T-O-V. Ra and Tov. And that word "ra" can be, it can be translated for the word friend. It can be translated for the word love or lover. Uh, it can be translated for the word neighbor. And it can be translated for our word called evil. Is your friend evil? Is your lover evil? Is your neighbor evil? <laughs> In your eyes, maybe. But not really. Total misunderstanding of the word and how it's used. We understand it in the Hebrew, we'll begin to take a clearer picture because you see, knowledge expands you for that which is both positive and that which is negative. It expands you into the arena of the, night, of the day and the arena of the night. It expands you in the arena of heaven and hell. It lets you know the opposites and the use of them because even though they're opposite, even though they're dual, they're not divided. They're one. The day and the night 
are one. Period. Up and down are one. They're not op they're not divided. They're opposite. You see, just exactly like my right hemisphere of my brain and my left here hemisphere of my brain, they're both male and female. They are opposite. But they're one. You shot you and God aren't opposite. You're one. And we have, we have lost this. We've lost the, the beauty of it. We've lost the, the understanding of it. So he says in verse 5 here, God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes will be open. Do, do you want to go through life with your eyes closed? It wouldn't make sense for you to go through life with your eyes closed, bumping into everything and running out of, running over everything. You know what Jesus said? The blind do what? The they run in the ditch. And if the blind lead the blind, they're all in the ditch. Where do they think? Where do you think they at today? <laughs> Trying to work their way out of the ditch. Why? Their eyes are closed. They're blind. It's foolish for you and me to think that a divine source that we call Father, or we want to call it God, would want us blind and ignorant. It's foolish for us to think that. It's foolish for us to think that love would even require that of me. Love doesn't require that of you and me. God does know that in the day that you eat, then your eyes will be open and you shall be what? Wow, well I thought that's what Genesis 1.26 said. That's why He created you. Y'all are really, really quiet. <laughs> that's why God created you, was to be as God. That's what God wanted you and me to live out our best life that way as God. Look at verse 22, this same chapter. Verse 22, it says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, knowing the difference of the tree. You think that's a bad thing? We've been told that's a bad thing. So we've been told, Oh my God, we can't let him live that way. Uh -uh, we're going to have to kill him. We've got to kill him. He, he, we can't let him live like that. He's like us now. He, he's he's going to be just like us. And so... I want to uh, I want to read you something. This is a little long, but I, I need to read it. Last week I, I drew it out and I read it, and I just put blank in. This time I'm not going to read it blank. I just want you to hear it and listen to it. It says, One of the greatest concepts the ancients had was that reality was spiritual, not material. That's a, that's a tremendous point. Reality is spiritual. It's not material. Everything in your material world is subject to the change of today and tomorrow. Because it will. How you feel today, you will not feel tomorrow. That is just how the weather is today, it will not be tomorrow. Everything in the material manifest world is changing. How the beauty of the fall is, is giving us a gift of today, it will be a complete different beauty in the spring. Okay? It, it's constantly changing. So reality is not here. It's not in the material changing world. Reality is in the spiritual world where it's eternal, unchanging. That reality was based in a spiritual, not a material, a c concept. And it was rooted in space. That space had not boundaries as we conceive boundaries. That space to the ancients was the ultimate answer. It, space, was the only recourse to analyze the mind as we know it. Space was the ultimate. It is the unconditioned because it extends beyond condition. All things that exist arise in space and vanish back into space. And again, the space and all it represents extends into the eternal. It, space, is that which has neither beginning nor end, it has no inferior or superior parts. It goes on forever and forever. Every part of itself is filled with light. Every part of itself is capable of releasing being itself from itself. It is a completely rich, inconceivable energy without a beginning and without an end. Everything that exists has its tap root in this space. It is totally, it is totally fullness. Space must be the most complete of all things. There is no lack anywhere in it. 
Its space cannot contain or exist anywhere in a vacuum. Its space is total fullness. It is, to it is total allness. Space is the source of every condition, yet itself is not conditioned. Space to the ancients was the spiritual fullness. To the ancient spiritual was spirituality was in space. It was the powerful, eternal, without beginning, without end, fullness of all things. All things that exist are fed directly or indirectly from space because everything that supports life is in space. Thus, space is the ever-benevolent parent of all that exists. It spreads itself and fills itself from the greatest to the smallest atom that exists. There is space between every cell, between every atom, between every planet, between every star, between every galaxy. It acts as a binding agent in which it holds all things together. Its space is the fullness of all that exists. And within its own mysterious way, it, it engenders time until ultimately the ancient world regarded space as the ultimate, the absolute. So space is not only the ultimate in which all things are and consist, it is the place from which all things come and within it are the principles from which all things exist. It contains within itself every conceivable and inconceivable structure, every tree, every flower, every bird, every animal, every insect, everything that exists has its root in space. Thus space within itself is the foundation and moving upon itself and within itself it engenders time, it engenders movement, it engenders all that it unfolds from space. Ultimately, the ancient world regarded space as the ultimate, the absolute, because no one has found in, in any way of finding the absolute in it. It maintains all finite things. They are part of it, yet within it is the infinite. So space is the place from which all things are. It is the place from which all things come. And within it, space are the, are the rules the laws, the principles from which all things are guided and directed. It has within it the foundation of energy, of time, of duration, of order, of organization. Its space has within itself the pattern of all things that were, that are, and or that ever will be. Now, that's a mouthful, right? And it, I last last week I said space, S-P-A-C-E. You know what most of the time we have been told in religion to substitute space for? Because you can, you can argue with what I just said, but most likely your argument wouldn't go very far. Because you have to realize between you and me right now is space. And what's between the space between you and me is inconceivable of the things that exist between just the space of you and me. It's just exactly like the space in an atom between a proton and the, uh, between a proton and an electron, the space that's in there. It's inconceivable, but nevertheless, it's there. It's just like from here to the farthest galaxy that we know, the space is inconceivable. So what have we been taught to call that? Heaven, somewhere out yonder, somewhere way out there, or we've been taught to call it this right here, God. Now, I, I don't have any problem with calling space God and God's space. I don't have any problem with that because they are pretty much the same thing. They're absolute. They're total. They're complete. They are the source of all that is. Period. When I have a better understanding of God. But if my understanding of God is based on religion and that He's an old gray-headed man living out yonder on this planet that we've termed heaven, I completely misunderstood what was said. And if I misunderstood what was said to that extent... I disempower myself because I don't realize that I am filled with this space. And I think I'm solid. <laughs> Touch me, handle me, see? I mean, I'm solid. No, you're space. We're all space. And so it's hard to grasp that space is not uh, disempowered. It is it's all powerful. Everywhere it is, no word it's not. So I want to close and read you something here, read you from a book. I don't think I may have never read from this book here. Uh, this is another book that I have spent many years in studying research and have written so much in it. 
but it has a, it's a companion book. The, it's called the Sefer. It's the Sefer and Yitzhar. There are many different translations of this particular book. This is just one of several that I have. And I don't recommend you go buy this book because you probably won't be able to understand it, period. It's just, and the reason I say that is you're going to have to memorize Kabbalah. If you're going to memorize all 22 glyphs and the 27 glyphs of Kabbalah, you've got to memorize them. You've got to memorize the numeric value. You've got to memorize the, the value of each one of them. It's extent. If you want to do that, then just go after it. But I, this book will help make this book clearer. Okay? So, this is uh, the uh, Sefer Yitzhara is, I think, 15 or 1600 words. So actually it can be put on a, probably a right at two pages. Maybe two and a half pages. But the extent of what's in those 15 or 1600 words is pageless. Hundreds of volumes have been written off of what those 15 or 1600 words say. Where's it from? I'm sorry? Where's it? Sifori Yitzhara, it's, most of it say that it was channeled through the uh, symbolic figure of Abraham. It, pre, it pre exists. Moses or any of the scriptures. Yeah, so it goes into ancient. There's two of these. There's called the Sefer Yitzhara and there's called the Sefer Bina. And they're companion books to each other. But I just want to read you this one. The first, this is the, this is the first uh, phrase, sentence, or paragraph, just a short paragraph, that's in this book of Sayings. It starts out this way. Within 32 mystical paths, 32 mystical paths, the reason they're called mystical is because between every space in this Kabbalistic tree, you go from here to 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 here, there are actually 22 blanks that can be connected inside this circle of 10 to give you a total of 32. Within the 32 mystical paths of wisdom, engraved Yah, the Hebrew word Yah, which actually the word Yah is, a, is another short word for source or energy or power of God. Yah, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the living God, the King of the universe, El Shaddai, merciful, gracious, high, exalted, dwelling in eternity, whose name is holy. He is lofty, and holy. That's what's in that little Hebrew word, Yah. Pretty powerful little word, right? <laughs> Yah. And he, or it, better pronunciation is it because it's androgynous. It's both male and female. It's not just the man. It's androgynous. So he created the universe with three books. These, this, this is the translation. This is called the Sepharim. The Sepharim is a, with, when you hear that mm, mm, you hear the, uh, the Hebrew mim. Why did Dan hear me? You hear the, the Hebrew, there's he, two Hebrew mims. That's a mim that's called 40. So everywhere you hear in scriptures a story that uses the number 40, like Moses, 40 days on the mountain, 40 days in the wilderness. All these times you hear this number 40, what 40 deals with is this right here. Uh, this is 40. This is 40. Always the glyph mem, whether it's mem and dual, or that's called mem and final. It's a block with a little loop on the edge of it. And it has a value of 600. Okay. So everywhere you see mem in Scripture, whether it's even if it's in the name of Moses, <coughs> Moses is a mythical character, not a literal historical character. Moses, his name is Moshe. You can hear the M, M, M. That has a, 
I know it looks like a G, but it has an M sound. M, 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 M. That has a 40 value. Mother has a 40 value. Martha has a 40 value. Mary has a 40 value. Marine has a 40 value. Water has a 40 value. Always it refers to the earth and its water content. And guess what? Paul says very clearly, don't you know that you are earthen vessels? And the content that you're made up of is water. So he says the universe with the three sephirim, with text, that's sephar, with numbers, that's sephir, and with communications, that's sephor. So the three ways that this was done is communicated these different ways through, through text, through number, and through communication. So many times, though, if we want to understand what's really being said, like for instance, Genesis 1, real quickly in closing, I'm closing, just turn over there real quickly, look at 1-1, one, one, just, just one word, we'll pick up here our next time. Genesis 1-1. One, one. You can read it out loud if you'd like. If somebody would like to just go ahead and read it, you got it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Okay. Okay. The, that word heaven that she just read, right here, heaven, that's the Hebrew word. Shin mem yod mem. That word is broken down into two concepts. It's broken down into the concept of Shin Mem. This is the this Mem is a 40 value. And so that Mem has to do with that that's earthen. That's that's of the earth, water and earth. That has to do. So that word Shin Mem are really what we would call the waters below. Have you heard of that phrase? Yes. Yeah. Why would I say the water's below? Because first, the natural. Is that right what Paul said? Yes. First, the natural. This 40 mil value deals with waters below. So it's first, the natural. So what's God doing? Well, the first thing God has to do, the source, the energy space, the first thing it has to do is build it a house to live in so that it can move into that house and through that house it can experience what it created. Otherwise it can't experience it if it's just sitting and looking through the windows and oh, look at that what it did. I wonder what that felt like. I wonder what that tastes like. I wonder how they, that, 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 that. You ain't gonna know until how. You come in there and do it yourself. You don't know what chocolate tastes like until you <coughs> taste chocolate. You talk about it. You say this, that, and the other, but you don't know. Well, you think God wants to build something and never experience it? God wants to build it and never feel it, never taste it, never know? God knows the, the lowest that we go to because God's in that. God knows the highest places, the heights that we reach to because God's in that. If we can ever grasp that and understand that, if we can realize that God is in all my calamity and having me created, and not judging me and not being angry or not being upset with me because I created it. If I could ever realize it and say, wait a minute, you know, I believe I could probably create this to where it would feel better. <laughs> that would be more fun. And then the last part of this word is yod. That yod is, has a 10 value and it actually refers to the duality of the physical body. And then it has the final mem. And the final meal, it has a 600 value. So now that this particular glyph carries it to the waters above. And if you'll think real clearly there in Genesis chapter 1, just a few more verses down, that's exactly what they're going to start to talk about. The first thing they talk about, the waters above and the waters below. Not realizing that the foundation has been laid right there in Genesis chapter 1, for the construction of the tabernacle, the temple, the house that God is building, which is you, and He builds you to live in you and to manifest itself through you. And when we grasp that and we begin to see that, it begins to transform me. It begins to change my world. It begins to change everything about it. And the foundation that He built this on was this right here. This is called 
Malkut right here. This is the same thing over here on the Kabbalistic tree. This is called Malkut, M-A-L-K-H-U-T, Malkut, and it actually is referring to the earth, Eretz, the earth, Eretz, Alif, Rash, Final Tassad. That's how you spell earth. It, didn't, it don't have anything to do with the dirt. Has more, it has more to do with a, a miracle substance that builds structures. All kinds of structures. It, it builds everything. There's nothing it can't build. It's called Mount Kut. It's the, same, it's the same thing over here. If I take it over here to this tree. It's just one tree. It's not two trees. It's how you see it. A tree above and a tree below. Just exactly like you. There are two of you. And those two of you, if they ever get in harmony and they ever get to working together, and you ever allow your spirit to rise up, to wake up and experience its salvation, experience its redemption, experience its restoration, then it will begin to show you a life that you have only dreamed of having. And that's the life that God wants us all to have and experience every day, all the days, all the time. And that's where we're going. Hallelujah. <laughs> There, there's, a way, there's an awakening going on in the earth now for us to come back to this ancient wisdom. This wisdom was called philosophy. And it got, it got neutered 1,700 years ago in a council over in Rome. And it created this thing that has been devastating and damaging and it has destroyed and killed and pillaged and plundered and murdered and robbed and raped for almost 2,000 years. And, uh, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> it did. It did. It did that. But that's being changed. Amen. Amen. It's being changed. God is waking us up. And so it's a better day today than it was yesterday. And it's just beginning. It's just beginning. It's, it's uh, hallelujah. It's just, it's just beginning. So hallelujah. Your tragedies, your difficult times, your hard times are fodder. Fertilizer. I know they stink. <laughs> I know you don't want to play it. But you are. We are. But they're going to grow something up inside us that's phenomenal. They're going to grow God up out of us because God's in us. And God is desiring to do that, to grow up out of us, grow up through us. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Anybody? Questions? Uh, I wrote my doctorate thesis years ago, and it was entitled Dominion, Man's Birthright. And in those days, I thought that we were coming to a place that we could command the birds and the elephants and all the things outside of ourselves in nature. But in the last few years, I've realized all of that, those things that we have to attain dominion over is part of our earthly human characteristics and everything is inside of us so now I'd have to rewrite the whole thing you know <laughs> <laughs> at least you got the doctor so. yeah, I got the doctor <laughs> but it's so true and I used to preach about all the you know the Zebusites and all the ites and kites and, and all of those enemies of Israel and all that and they're all inside of us that's what we have to, not so much as to have dominion over anymore as I see it, but to bring those parts of myself that I thought was enemies outside myself. And then I began to see there were enemies inside myself, and then I began to understand, no, I have no enemies. It's parts of me that are unbalanced. We don't need to get rid of anything. We just need to bring all things into balance. To have a, a, a car battery is balanced because it has a positive and a negative charge. In the ground. In the ground. It's got to be grounded. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can preach hours on that. Just that one thing. But it's all inside us. We're learning to come into balance and having the truth anymore. To me is 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 uh, having the truth about myself is realizing there's nothing wrong with me. I have no enemies. I have nothing I need to destroy or get rid of or die to my flesh and all of that. 
It's all a vital part of the push and pull, the tension of the in and the out and the up and the down and, and the heaven and earth and all of that. Is we just need to come into a balance of who we are. That's knowing ourselves. We're not trying to get rid of any part of ourselves, but just to balance all the things in ourselves. God's eyes, you are extremely beautiful. Yes. Fearfully wonderful. I know because I am God. Today. And I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> I see you. Y'all remember the avatar? She said, I see you. Yes. I see you. Good things are breaking forth. Yeah. You know. Remember back early in the spring when that plant pushed its way up through that concrete we said yes. that, was, that was the most fun not little bitty green plant pushed right up through that concrete that's exactly what you and I are pushing through source is pushing through us those great things I love you anybody else?